Okay, 1968, uh, one of the more important years in our nation's history. Uh, really one of three years I think you can look at that would uh, be turning points, 1789, 1865, and 1968. I will cover 1968 in mostly chronological fashion, except for the fact I will cover pretty much the entire year except for the Democratic National Convention in the first video lecture. Uh, even, in, even the presidential campaign itself I will cover in this first lecture. The second lecture will cover the Democratic National Convention itself. Now I title these two uh, video lectures The Route of the Liberals. And I'm going to get to that here in a minute. This comes from the title of a chapter in Alan Matuso's Unraveling of America, A History of America in the 1960s. Now, if there's one book that you buy from this time frame, one book that you're turned on to from this class, I hope it's The Unraveling of America. Matuso thoroughly covers the whole decade in his work. I mean, politics, society, economics, culture everything. Uh, does it in a very even-handed way, um, provides some great specifics, great details as to how people felt at the time, how they reacted, etc. So just go to Amazon right now, purchase Alan Matuso, The Unraveling of America. There you go. Hopefully he sends me a few cents for doing that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Matuso referred to 1968 as the route of the liberals, R-O-U-T. They had promised to manage the economy, solve the race problem, end poverty, keep the peace. But did they? New economists had promised that they could improve the economy, reduce taxes, expand spending, ensure prosperity, and even achieve full employment. But the reality was much different. Inflation had hit 4% annually by, this, by the end of the decade. The dollar was declining overseas. We have high interest rates. Race issues also persisted. Uh, regardless of new legislation, regardless of new attitudes, again, toward the end of the decade, we see increasing militancy in the civil rights movement. Um, but the problems, of course, continue. Poverty did not end. It went down temporarily. Uh, but in the long run, this remained an issue. And even uh, eventually poverty would, and many of its problems would actually increase. Some argued this was due to the fostered dependence on the system that the Great Society had provided. Others uh, provide detailed accounts of how the Great Society actually led to more economic problems and increased, again, poverty and the problems associated with it. Again, there are numerous works that kind of cover both sides, um, but we can see many of the effects of Johnson's ideas in the 60s, which were made with the best of intentions, actually leading to major problems in the 1970s. Some of those Nixon would have to deal with, and some of them Nixon would indeed exacerbate. Now, of course, again, to raise awareness, we look at poverty. You have the Poor People's Campaign or the establishment of Resurrection City. This was created in the West Potomac Park, just south of the Lincoln Memorial. Thousands of poor people would set up shacks to force acknowledgement of this festering problem. As far as peace, there's no peace. Vietnam, of course, only gets worse over the course of the decade. Leadership promised peace negotiations. Peace never came. So when we get into how the year progressed, we'll start with Tet, T-E-T, -E the Tet Offensive, January 31st. Um, with this, the Viet Cong, North Vietnamese, would take their fight from the jungle to the cities. Again, this was primarily the Viet Cong, those who were kind of undercover in the South, um, <clears throat> lived in the, in the jungles, etc. Tet was a Buddhist holiday, um, and that was the dominant religion in the nation. Over 80,000 Viet Cong troops coordinated attacks on every major metropolitan center in South Vietnam. These surprise strikes were made on American bases, Da Nang, for example, even at American Embassy in Saigon. Now, overall, the U.S. and South Vietnam would regain the territory they initially lost at Tet, and they would inflict twice as many casualties on the Viet Cong that they suffered themselves. Thus, this was considered a military victory. Now, those of you who are lucky enough to take Civil War class with me, um, we studied Gary Gallagher and his discussion of the Overland Campaign in 1862. And Gallagher's thesis was battles are not defined necessarily by the number of casualties or lost area or gained territory. They're about the overall impact of the battle, the both short and long-term impact of the battle. 
This was considered a military victory, but in many ways it shattered our view of Vietnam, our view of our role in Vietnam, and it would lead to new investigation by real journalists that we used to have these things called journalists. They did actual investigation. It wasn't just about their political views, but real journalists would investigate what's going on in Vietnam. We'll get to that here in a minute. So why is Tet so important? Again, part of the strategy, but <clears throat> this was a psychological defeat on our nation as well as our troops. Again, sure, we inflicted more casualties. We didn't lose any ground, but the psychological damage of this victory on both the American people and the troops was significant. In January of 1968, only 28% of Americans labeled themselves dubs. Now, of course, you have dubs and hawks. Dubs are people who are against war in general. Hawks are those who support war when it's necessary in general. So in January of 1968, before Tet, 28% of Americans labeled themselves dubs. After Tet, um, dubs outnumbered hawks 42 to 41%. This was in the span of only a couple weeks. I often talk about the issue of credibility. The American people were told over and over, the war is almost over, we're making all this progress, we're gonna deal with them. But Tet showed that the government had mishandled and probably did lie about the war. And again, this affected troop morale. <clears throat> we're gonna to get to more of Vietnam here in a minute. Uh, in February, we see uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, labor leader, would begin his hunger strike to bring attention to the plight of immigrant workers in California. One reason he did this was to inject civil disobedience into the United Farm Workers and minimize the use of violence in their strikes. Now, uh, basically, again, this is a group of immigrant workers in Central Valley, California, who are working for very little pay. Uh, they're in bad working conditions. In, in some ways, it's similar to what we see in American industry in the end of the 19th century. I mean, they're, um, there's no real regulation. They're kind of left on their own. Chavez, of course, is their leader. Uh, he almost dies during this hunger strike. When it was over in March, he actually couldn't even speak. He had to provide a written statement um, showing that he did believe he made progress. Significantly, Bobby Kennedy would come to his side and show public support. Um, which led to more, uh, again, more public recognition of the union, its leader, and the issues they faced. And I've talked before about the importance of publicity with any issue. Chavez certainly gained it at this time, especially with Kennedy's support. Uh, February 1st, South Vietnamese security officials ex execute a Viet Cong prisoner on film in the Tet aftermath. Uh, this is an infamous picture. You've seen this uh, of the gun straight up to the gentleman's head. Later that month, February 27th, I mentioned real journalist Walter Cronkite, uh, very much the voice of America at this time. He would report about a trip that he had recently taken to Vietnam on his television show, Who, What, Where, When, and Why. Now, Cronkite, after Tet, was curious, what's going on over there? Again, he goes over there, he investigates. He is highly critical of United States officials. He stated that the war was not going, as claimed by American leaders, and he called for the United States to go to the negotiating table, even if this meant we were losers in the war, but supporters of democracy who, quote, did the best they could. So here you have... Uh, an unofficial leader in America calling for an end to the war. Cronkite doesn't have to worry about credibility, but again, his honesty comes through. You see uh, in February of 27, more chaos even in New York, uh, I'm sorry, February of 1968, uh, the garbage strike in New York City, um, which lasted all month. It would finally come to an end at the end of the month. If anybody has seen the movie Out of Towners with Jack Lemmon, you've seen kind of how that would appear. Um, great movie and the fact that it was done at that time is just kind of coincidence but uh again this kind of shows kind of some labor unrest we see in the country we get to march and uh the primaries kick up and there's an important primary we see in new hampshire one which would tra change the trajectory of the race for the democrats um was really an astounding uh final result now of course, Lyndon Johnson's president. He is going to run as president again. Uh, he is in this primary, and he wins the New Hampshire primary. Great. That's expected. But what happened? McCarthy, um, Eugene, not Joseph, uh, almost won the New Hampshire primary. This was revolutionary. No sitting president had ever been in danger of losing a primary, especially that early. But here we go. Johnson, this guy who's been in power since Kennedy was assassinated, almost loses 
the New Hampshire primary. McCarthy, for his part, creates a significant support cast. He has what's called the Children's Crusade. Um, American youth come out in droves to support McCarthy. Thousands of student volunteers would take to the area to seek support for him. Uh, we're going to get to clean for Gene here in a little bit, but this was monumental to have all these youths come together to support Eugene McCarthy and his children's crusade. Now, what's McCarthy running on? Simply put, an anti-war message. He wants us to get out of Vietnam as soon as possible. So this happens on March 12th. Four days later, Bobby Kennedy suddenly announces that he will run for the Democratic nomination in the party. Um, this is significant because he wasn't going to run before. He assumed Johnson would win. And of course, Kennedy wants the presidency. But once he sees McCarthy has made such inroads that there is a lot of chaos in the Democratic Party, that there's significant division, that not everybody's agreeing, he realizes, hey, I'm going to get in there and run as well. Um, again, he sees the weakness of LBJ after McCarthy's success. He, in very many ways, rode uh, McCarthy's coattails into this election campaign. Uh, the same day uh, that Kennedy enters the race, we see the My Lai Massacre. More than 500 Vietnamese civilians are gunned down by U.S. ground troops from Charlie Company. Again, another embarrassing episode in Vietnam, another thing that leads to more uh, disillusionment, if you will, among the American people. Uh, this uh, Two weeks later, less than two weeks later, in Memphis, March 28th, violence would erupt. Martin Luther King Jr. had gone down to Memphis to support sanitation workers who were on strike. He would lead a march which turned violent, leading to 60 people being injured and a teenage boy killed. We're going to get more uh, King in Memphis here in a minute. Three days later, Lyndon Johnson gives an important speech to the American people in which he announces he will limit bombing of North Vietnam. Almost as an addendum toward the end of his speech, he announces he will not seek re-election as president. Now, this again is a major issue or a major event. Never had a president just back down because he was scared he wasn't going to win his re-election campaign. Um, but Johnson realizes that the American people have kind of had enough. He realizes he has lost quite a bit of popularity. Um, he realizes he should not seek re-election for president. It does not mean that he will not end his uh, candidacy with a bang. But at this point, he decides, I need to step away. Strangely enough, when I talk to people uh, who were alive back then, many liberals felt, oh, this was great news. We cheered. We celebrated. Well, it also meant eventually the loss for the Democrats in the election. I don't think I'm giving anything away here in 1968. But the fact that he backed out really affected the Democrats' chances going forward. And we're going to get to that chaos here in a little bit. I mentioned King is in Memphis to support sanitation workers. Uh, on April 4th, of course, he is shot and assassinated by James Earl Ray. Um, he was staying at the Lorraine Motel where he was shot from across the street by Ray. Um, of course, he is out on the deck of the motel. If you go to, I've mentioned many times, the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, it is located at the Lorraine Motel. And King's room is left completely intact from where he left it when he went out onto the balcony before he was shot. It's quite moving. Uh, and again, it's, it's really something to kind of experience to see that part as well as the history that they provide there of that. So again, King is shot at the Lorraine Motel by James Earl Ray. This of course leads to mass rioting, which we're going to get to in a minute. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, hears about this while he's giving a speech in Indianapolis. He immediately pleads with the audience, quote, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Now, rioting and violence would ensue, but this really, I think, kind of reflects Kennedy's magnetism. I mean, immediately he hears about this and immediately he has just the right words to say. He was one of the few who could bring different disparate groups together. When we get to the campaign more in specifics, we'll get to that. So again, this leads to riots all over the nation in no less than 125 cities. Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Detroit, Kansas City, Newark, Washington, even Omaha. 46 deaths will ultimately be blamed on these riots. Now in Chicago, as someone who's a 
foreshadowing, if you will, of what we'll see at the convention. Of course, Richard Daly is the mayor of Chicago. This is the last of the quote unquote great political machines in the United States. And Daly was very much a fascist. He ordered the city police to quote, shoot to kill arsonists and quote, shoot to maim or cripple looters in any future rioting. Um, now he made the statement on April 15th after the worst of the rioting, but he was he made the statement because he was disappointed. He thought his police knew that this was the general order if there was rioting. Again, he told his police, shoot to kill arsonists and shoot to maim or cripple looters. Hmm. This would further embolden many black power activists, which we've talked about in a previous video lecture. As people grew a little bit disillusioned with King, they grow more toward a more um, aggressive militant stance. And his assassination truly would lead to the flowering of this black power movement. Floyd McKissick, for one, stated that with the death of King, nonviolence died with him. And, quote, white people are going to suffer as much as black people. A week later, April 11th, a new troop ceiling is announced at 549,500 troops. Even though we're cutting back on the bombing. A week later, there is a nationwide telephone strike. Again, continued labor unrest. Five days after that, we see the occupation of the low administration building at Columbia. Um, then the takeover of four more buildings by students. Seven days later, the police would finally storm these buildings and violently remove students who had taken over campus entities. This is where you see the famous speech or the famous image of the new left leader with his cigarette feet up on the president's desk at the I uh, University. The next month, May, uh, we see unrest over the larger part of the world. We have Bloody Monday in Paris. This was a Parisian student revolt fighting between rioters and police. It grew quite nasty. Um, 1968, very much an important year for many countries. We're going to get to a couple others here in a minute. I had mentioned earlier Resurrection City and District of Columbia. This is established. This was an encampment on the mall in D.C. led by the SCLC and Ralph Abernathy. Um, they, had grant, they were granted a permit, but a month later, the site would be raided by police. It would be demolished. The Department of Interior refused to extend their permit behind, beyond June 23rd. Still, though, the police would come in, destroy the encampment, well before this uh, was to end. Early June 4th, uh, the evening of June 4th, or June 4th, the Democratic primary in California is held. Bobby Kennedy cruises to victory. After this is over in the wee hours of the 5th, he addresses a large crowd of supporters at the Ambassador Hotel in San Francisco. At this time, he is shot by Sirhan Sirhan, uh, a uh, Palestinian who believed, uh, he, well, he shot Kennedy because he believed Kennedy was pro-Israeli. He didn't like his pro-Israeli speeches. Um, I'm sorry, he was a Jordanian. Sirhan Sirhan was a Jordanian. But again, he believed that Kennedy was not giving proper credit to Palestine. He believed that Kennedy was pro-Israeli and that he would uh, further oppress, if you will, Palestinians. So what's the right thing to do? Shoot him, I guess. Um, this is the impact of this cannot be overemphasized on the left or on liberals or on Democrats in general. Kennedy was the last great hope. Um, he was considered, again, the one person who could bring everybody together for the Democrats. Uh, when he is assassinated, many lose hope. McCarthy would lose hope. Um, he went into doldrums. Many of his staff talked about for days. He couldn't even be talked to, um, even though he and Kennedy were not good friends at all. Um, he was still devastated by this, and he felt somewhat, uh, it was his responsibility that Kennedy got in the race. He felt responsible for Kennedy's assassination. I mentioned Paris on the 27th of June. We see Prague Spring began. This was a revolution in Czechoslovakia over communist rule. The following day, a bill adding a 10% surcharge to income taxes and reduction of government spending is signed by Johnson. He admits it is impossible to provide both guns and butter. So, again, this gets to his great society. What's one of the main reasons the great society fails? There's a war going on. You can't fund both at the same time. You can't fund these major domestic programs and a war at the same time. You cannot have guns and butter. And Johnson finally realizes this. In July, we have the Yippies come onto the stage, the Young Independent Party. 
uh, they come onto this national stage with the Yippies are going to Chicago. Now, this was a movement. Uh, it was a group of activists, including Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, Paul Krasner. Their desire was to cause disorder in public places. They disrupted trading in the New York Stock Exchange. They destroyed clocks at Grand Central Terminal in New York City. Um, again, youth, uh, I'm not, I said independent, I'm sorry, the Youth International Party. Um, this was essentially a group of political or politicized hippies. Again, their desire to create a paradise of sex and dope through revolution. They would hold what they called the Festival of Life in Chicago at the convention, which we'll get to. This was in contrast to what they said was the death that was the convention. They would take part in what they called monkey warfare instead of guerrilla warfare. They practiced absurdism. They were not a real movement in the sense that we might consider them, but more of a myth. Still, they were able to organize thousands of students for Chicago and would be a very important player at the convention. Getting back to Czechoslovakia on August 20th, the Soviet Union would invade the tiny country, ending the Prague Spring and enforcing impressive normalization measures. So the Soviet Union very much collects and maintains its power at this time. We skip August because of the convention. We'll get back to that. In September, women's on the 7th, women's liberation groups, uh, including now, would protest the Miss America Beauty Contest. One protester claims that they, quote, won't do anything dangerous, just a symbolic bra burning. Now, there are, of course, claims of these massive bra burnings. That's not what happened. It happens with one or two people. It's symbolic. It is important. Um, but don't think that every woman was running around burning her bra. October 12th, Mexican, Mexico City hosts the Summer Olympics. 32 African nations boycott because of the inclusion of South Africa. Um, apartheid in South Africa will continue uh, for over two more decades, even though we see, again, this first boycott at this time. Two U.S. athletes, of course, perform the Black Power Salute during the Star Spangled Banner at their medal ceremony. Again, very symbolic, very powerful. If you've seen the image, you realize how powerful it was. October 31st, Johnson announces a total halt to U.S. bombing in North Vietnam. Shall I say temporary? November 5th, we have an election, which we're going to provide here in a minute. And on November 14th, there are protests and rallies on college campuses throughout the country during National Turn In Your Draft Card Day. Again, when we look at Vietnam, one of the major issues with many Americans was the draft. Young kids being forced to go fight in the military against their will in a war that they didn't really understand against people who they didn't know were their opponents. This has all been hashed over many times, but I cannot, again, overemphasize the impact of the draft as that was key to anti-war movement. As mentioned, there was a presidential election. And the campaign, again, lasts throughout the year. Now, I want to get to some of the key players here. Richard Nixon, of course, lost in 1960. He would return in 1968. Ronald Reagan was a potential candidate in 1968, but he had promised to complete his full term as California governor, so he was out. Otherwise, uh, he likely would have won. George Romney, you've heard the last name before, was a bit waffly. Um, he was kind of in and out. He didn't have a strong personality. He didn't garner much support. Rockefeller joined too late to make a difference. Nixon would run on law and order. He even devised the idea of black capitalism in which he proposed that African Americans rebuild their ghettos. He did not want to break up the ghettos. He wanted them to rebuild their communities, mainly by promoting investment in black neighborhoods and the employment of African Americans in these businesses. His quote, let black people have a piece of the action. And by saying this, of course, he was saying, let them attain ownership of their own businesses let them employ their own people. Let them become an independent force in and among themselves. Now, this sounds a little bit even like Garvey, if you get to Marcus Garvey and his economic views, and very much like what we see with black power advocates, who, again, believe that economic self-determination is the key to true independence, to true rights. And again, this is what Nixon is very much reiterating. Some might look at this in a negative way, I would say, though. And Nixon, of course, was no huge civil rights guy, right? But... He recognized the issue and how, well, one of the potential solutions. So I think he, he deserves credit for that. But you rarely hear Nixon and black power in the same sentence in a positive way. What about Democrats? Again, we've talked about Johnson drops out. Um, 
and they would go, the party would very much go back and forth. This starts with clean for Gene McCarthy, Eugene McCarthy, again, pretty much the antithesis of Joseph McCarthy. McCarthy's main thrust was that he was against the war. He was the peace candidate. His wife, Abigail, described his constituency as, quote, academia united with the mobile society of scientists, educators, technologists, and the new post-World War II college class. Okay, sounds, uh, well, McCarthy himself took pleasure in observing that Kennedy was, quote, running ahead of me among the less intelligent and less well-educated voters of the country. <laughs> McCarthy was a bit arrogant, uh, again, quite the academic, and he looked down on others. And if you think again about what his wife said about his constituency, not exactly the mainstream in America. Uh, and then, of course, taking stabs at Kennedy like that, um, but for some, uh, I mean, he, he definitely represented this new suburban chic. Again, he's educated, he's an academic, um, he's an expert. So many, of course, kind of, you know, believe, wow, maybe he's got a chance. Many of his staff, though, didn't know if he even wanted to be president or if he should be. He had great support because of his views on key issues, but he was not personable. He often did things detrimental to his own campaign. Uh, for example, he discarded excellent speeches uh, by underlings because... He believed that they maybe did not use the right verbiage. They did not express what he thought. He ignored chaos of his own staff. Again, there was internal division. He kind of left it alone. He insulated himself from other politicians, um, and he insulted people. For example, uh, after the Indiana primary, um, in which Robert Kennedy won, he intimated that Indianans were ignorant. Quote, you can hardly expect to win under those circumstances. That's not going to garner you a lot of support. One of his speech writers compared him to, quote, certain athletes who would rather lose than go all out and win. Because if you go all out and lose, then there is, um, then one is without excuse. But what this person is saying is that McCarthy um, wasn't going all out to win. And that way, if he lost, well, that was why. It wasn't because he wasn't loved or wasn't because that uh, he didn't garner a lot of support. He was very critical of the United States and its Cold War policies and actions. Unlike Bobby Kennedy and Nixon, he wanted ghettos destroyed, and he wanted to disperse blacks out of it to other neighborhoods. Bobby Kennedy, as I mentioned earlier, came into the uh, race a little bit late. He picked up ground after he saw weakness of, of Lyndon Johnson, and he waited until after New Hampshire to enter the race. This was problematic because it allowed McCarthy to take the peace wing of the Democrat Party. If Kennedy had jumped in immediately, um, he certainly would have been able to achieve more support uh, than McCarthy. He would have been the peace wing candidate. Would it have made a difference? Of course, we don't know. Sirhan Sirhan probably still would have assassinated him, but it may have changed things. Uh, again, we don't know. So uh, Kennedy, for himself, he made passionate speeches uh, against the war. He called out American leadership as losing its traditional spirit and turning dark. After King's assassination, um, he would turn to race more as an issue, urging national reconciliation. And again, his speeches were magnetic. They were amazing. Um, and they really tamed a lot of the violence that we would see. He was the only candidate who could walk through the streets of white working class and black neighborhoods and be cheered in each. This was significant for Democrats. Again, we go back to the New Deal coalition. Um, but you look at a Johnson, maybe not loved as much in African-American neighborhoods. McCarthy, certainly not. Again, he is very highbrow. Even in the white working class neighborhoods, he was not necessarily um, embraced. His anti-war message was, but he himself and many of his ideas were not. Bobby Kennedy, for his part, again, he could bring both these groups together as few could. And these were his main constituencies. He reached out to middle class Americans with his version of law and order. Um, of course, after he is uh, assassinated, Hubert Humphrey would truly be the last man standing. We're going to get to a little bit of uh, Johnson's view on Humphrey in the second part of this video lecture. So you have Nixon, you have Humphrey, you also have George Wallace. Now we've talked about Henry Wallace, the progressive. Much like Eugene McCarthy was the antithesis of Joseph McCarthy, George Wallace was very much the opposite of Henry Wallace. George Wallace, uh, officially a Democrat, but he broke off. He ran as an independent. Um, and, of course, he was the one who tried to stop African-Americans from entering the University of Alabama. Segregation now, 
segregation forever, if you'll remember right. He was extremely popular in the South, but he was also popular in the North among many blue-collar types. He ran as a populist. He voiced the social resentments of the lower classes and defended their economic interests. He endorsed labor unions and a public works program to provide employment for anybody who wanted a job. Um, and again, this is significant that he would reach out to these working classes. Um, and part of this, well, here's a quote from uh, Matuso regarding Wallace. Mostly, of course, his appeal rested on his naked hatred for long hair, hippies, rioters, and students flying Viet Cong flags, as well as anti-war types. He earned a great deal of support from unionized factory workers because of this. Um, because many at the time, it's late 60s, they're tired of rich, educated white kids complaining, whether it was about the war or about trying to create some kind of new reality that the new left was about. They were sick of African Americans um, rioting, complaining, even though all this had been done for them. Many of these white working class individuals felt that they had been marginalized, that they had been left out, that all this was going on Everybody was complaining. Everybody was getting a piece of the pie except them. Wallace, again, a pretty magnetic personality, was able to bring them into his sphere. Once at a rally in New York, the police successfully kept out demonstrators. Wallace's aides secretly provided tickets to demonstrators so that they could get in and cause a confrontation. When he was asked if he got mad at the demonstrators, Wallace replied, quote, get mad at them? Why, they got me a half a million votes. Wallace, again, understood the situation. He would not be on the, uh, well, he would not be on the election form in all states. Yet, he would earn 46 electoral votes, which shows you, again, some of the support he had. Now, when we get to the final tally, of course, Nixon wins. Nixon earned 301 electoral votes. Humphrey earned 191. So this was pretty much, maybe not the whooping like a, uh, Reagan Carter or Reagan Mondale, but Nixon took him to town. Now, he only won by, I believe, 500,000 uh, popular votes, but the popular vote doesn't matter. This is a republic, not a democracy. Okay, so that is, 90, uh, that is the Route of the Liberals Part 1. We'll come back to Route of the Liberals Part 2, in which we focus on the Democratic National Convention in 1968.